Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the Torah of Messiah. Today I want to jump into a prophecy that's directly given to us in Deuteronomy chapter 21, but as we're going to see in a moment, it's a reference all the way back to Genesis 29 and 30 that is being fulfilled continually throughout the Gospel of Matthew and even until today. It's still not fulfilled, but it's in the process of fulfillment. And what I want to, what I want to tell us is that we have to understand when we study Torah, we have to look at Torah through a lens of symmetry. Symmetry. There's balance in Torah. And what I mean by that is you may have heard it, because it's, it's, it's not necessarily a rare uh, thought process, but you may have heard that Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, the first four books of the Torah, are summed up in the book of Deuteronomy. It's the reason why you'll read the book of Deuteronomy and you'll go, oh, well, this was already given, this was already given, this is repeating, this is repeating, this is repeating. However, there's over 70 new uh, commandments in, in, in the book of Deuteronomy, so there's a ton of new things into it, but there's what we call explanations of things that are already given that are not explained previously. They're mentioned previously, but they're not explained. And Deuteronomy does this very, very well. Moses comes and gives his own commentary. It's why it says, these are the words of Moses in the book of Deuteronomy. Moses is now coming and explaining the commandments, which we actually see in the first couple chapters of Deuteronomy. He literally says this, I'm coming to explain it to you. Now, what we'll find is that in the book of Deuteronomy, you'll actually find commandments that are given, new commandments that are given due to something that took place earlier in Torah. This is why I say that there's symmetry. You might think that the first four books are summed up in Deuteronomy, but the last four books are also summed up in Genesis. There are things that are given in, the, in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy because of something that took place in the Genesis narrative. Genesis is more of a story-based book not so much commandments, although there are some commandments like be fruitful and multiply or circumcision, right? These things were given as commandments in the book of Genesis. However, it's more of a story-like narrative where those commandments that are given in Exodus through Deuteronomy are actually being lived out. And we're going to see that here in just a moment, okay? So, in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 21, starting in verse 15, it says, mm-hmm. The text says, listen very carefully, in Deuteronomy 21, 15, it says, If there will be for a man two wives... One is loved, and one is hated. And they will both beget to him children, the one who is loved and the one who is hated. But the firstborn son will be to the one who is hated. And then it gives you commandments of what you shall do. Did you catch that? Did you catch what is taking place? The Torah in Deuteronomy 21 is telling us, If there is a man who has two wives, one is loved and one is hated, they both give him children, but the firstborn is to the one that is hated. Is there any story previously, specifically in Genesis, where there is a man who takes two wives, one, it says in the Torah, one is loved and one is hated, they both give him kids, But the one who is hated actually gives him the firstborn. I'll tell you who it is. It's Jacob. In Genesis 29. Read Genesis 29. It's not Abraham, Hagar, and Sarah. Because it doesn't actually say Sarah is loved and Hagar is hated. That's not what the text says. It never says that. In Genesis 29 and 30, it says Jacob takes two wives. Rachel and Leah. And it specifically says the same words used here. Leah is the one who is hated, and Rachel is the one who Jacob loves. And it says in Deuteronomy, the one who is hated will give you the firstborn son. Who is Jacob's firstborn? Reuben. Who's the mother of Reuben? 
Leah, the one who's hated. There are commandments given here because of something that took place there. You have to read the rest of this passage and you'll see what's taking place because it says that you shall give the firstborn status to the firstborn, not to the one whom you love. And notice what happens. Jacob gives the firstborn status. He takes it away from Reuben and he gives it to Joseph. Okay? And so it's, it's correcting behaviors based off of something that took place in the Genesis narrative. Okay? But I want to show us something real quick because there's an incredible prophecy here that has to do with Jesus, Judaism, and Christianity. Judaism being, being, the, being one bride and, 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 and Christianity being the other. Really, it's the Jews being one bride, Gentile being another. And we're going to get to see this in a moment. But the text says right here in, Genesis, or in Deuteronomy 21.15, it says, If there will be a man with two wives, we're talking about the Messiah. Everything has to do with the Messiah, first of all. We have to understand this. Every story, every blessing, every curse, every commandment, Jesus is the Word of God. Everything about the Word of God is Him. All about Him, for Him, through Him, from Him. He is the Word of God. Everything is Jesus. So here in Deuteronomy 21.15, it says, If there will be a man with two wives. The phrase two wives, Shtenashim, This is, this is the phrase that's used, Shtei Nashim, two wives. Well, I'm about to show us something in Gematria. Gematria, I have an entire, I have multiple videos on Gematria. In fact, I have a teaching on my YouTube called The Four Layers of God's Word, which is a very insightful video that I encourage you to watch. I also have two teachings on Gematria. One is What is Gematria Part 1? One is What, what is Gematria Part 2? Both of these are older teachings. But I talk about Gematria being the numerical system of... Hebrew and or even Aramaic because Aramaic has the same letters as Hebrew. But Gematria is where every letter has a certain number that corresponds to it. And you can add up a, a, you know, the letters of a word or of a phrase or of an entire verse and you can get what it's called, it's Gematria, it's numerical value. And if there is a certain letter, word or phrase or verse that has this numerical value, this gematria, and, and then you find another place that has the same gematria, it means there's a direct reference between them, and this is how you interpret things. And it, this is used all throughout the New Testament. So for example, in Revelation chapter 13, verses 15 through 18, it talks about the Antichrist, and it says the Antichrist who will come, it says, a man with wisdom will be able to know these things. It will be the number of his name, which is 666. Let a man with wisdom understand these things. The number of his name being 666, I've talked about this over and over again. It's a reference to the gematria of his name. For example, if we take Shechem, the son of Hamor, in Genesis 34. Shechem ben Hamor, Shechem the son of Hamor, in gematria equals 666. And it says in Genesis 34 that if you don't allow Dina to marry him, the brothers can't buy or sell in the land. What does Revelation 13 say? If you don't get the mark of 666, you can't buy or sell. So it's a reference to Gematria. Gematria is used all throughout the New Testament. I can show it in the book of John. I mean, it's, it's all, I can show it in 1 Corinthians and Revelation with the 144,000, the man of 666. The 153 fish that's in the book of John 20 and 21. I mean, it's literally all over the place. Okay? So I say that to say... In Deuteronomy 21.15, when it says that there's a man with two wives, Shetei Nashim, and Gematria is equivalent to 1,110. 11, 11.10. 11.10 is also equivalent to another phrase from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 1. Mashiach... Yeshua Ben David Ben Avraham Messiah Yeshua Son of David Son of Abraham Gen or Matthew 1, verse 1. So who is the man with the two wives? 
It's Messiah Yeshua, son of David, son of Abraham. It's a prophecy. And like I said, the, the prophecy has to do with Rachel and Leah, with Jacob, and it has to do with the Jews and the Gentiles and Jesus. Now we have to understand, now we have to understand the narrative through the vessel of the Torah, because the Torah is a book of prophecy, according to Deuteronomy 34, verse 10. So we have to look at it through the lens of prophecy going forward to understand things about the Messiah, about his first coming, his second coming, and so forth. So in Genesis 29, Jacob says to, to Laban, he says, Laban, I want Rachel. That's totally who I want. That's who I came for. I did not come for Leah. I want Rachel. I'll work for her for seven years. So Jacob comes, and he wants Rachel. He works for Rachel, but he doesn't get Rachel. Who does he get? He gets Leah. The same way Jesus, his first coming, he says twice, by the way, in the book of Matthew alone, he says twice, which I'll read. He says once in Matthew 15, he tells a Gentile who wants to come to him, he says, no, I did not come for you. He goes, I only came in Matthew 15, verse 24, V'yan v'yomer lo shulachti ki im elatzon ha'avodot l'veit Israel. I only came for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I only came for the Jews. And then he says in Matthew 23, 37 through 40, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how I long to gather you like a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Your house will be left desolate. Surely I tell you, you will not see me again till you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, which is a quote from Psalm 118, verse 26, which is a passage in, in prophecy I won't get into in this video. But he says it twice in Matthew. I came for the Jews. That's who I came for. I did not come for the Gentiles. So, J so Jacob comes for Rachel. He works for Rachel. He doesn't get Rachel. He gets Leah. Jesus comes for the Jews. He works for the Jews. He doesn't get the Jews. He gets Gentiles. This is why it says in John 10, verse 16, he tells the Jewish people, I have sheep that are not of this fold. I must go and get them and the two flocks will become one with one shepherd. Rachel and Leah, he goes, I came for Rachel, but hey, I have to go get Leah, and I have to bring her with Rachel, and they will both have one groom, one husband, one shepherd. These are the two wives, the two women, the one who is loved, who is, who is referenced and, and, and seen prophetically as the Jewish people, and then the ones who are hated. And it's not because Jesus hates us or anything of this sort. It's a matter of how Gentiles are viewed. Gentiles are viewed as unclean. They're viewed as hated. They're viewed as wicked. They're viewed as pagan. Okay? And it shows us all these deep insights. It says Rachel has, has a nice body, but Leah has tender eyes. So it tells us how to actually relate to the Jew and to the Gentile, which I won't get into that in this passage. I speak about this in depth. By the way, this whole prophecy is embedded deeply rooted in my, my first book, Joseph's Identity Crisis, Uncovering the Messiah. But what it's actually showing is these two brides with Jacob and these two brides with Jesus. And the two must become one. Now here's the question. If we go back to the book of prophecy, Genesis 29. Jacob first gets Leah, just like Jesus first gets the Gentiles. Jacob doesn't get Rachel. Jesus doesn't get the Jews. So the question becomes, how does Jacob get Rachel? Because the same way Jacob gets Rachel is the same way that Jesus is going to get the Jews. One does not replace the other. They both have to come together as one fold. The question is how? Well, the book of prophecy tells us in the book of Genesis. The Torah of the Messiah gives us the roadmap to team up with him so that he can return. Because remember, Jesus says he will not return until the Jewish people Say, Until they say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 23, 37 through 40. I will not return until the Jews say to me. Okay? Well, Jacob gets Leah, but he still wants Rachel. Just like Jesus has gotten the Gentiles, he's gotten Christianity, but he still wants the Jews. He still wants Judaism. How? 
Genesis 29 tells us. Laban, who's a picture of the father, the father of Rachel and Leah, just like our father of Christianity and our father of Judaism is the same father. Laban tells the son. The, the father tells the Messiah what you have to do. You get Christianity first. You get the Gentiles first. You want the Jews? You want Leah? Here's what, I mean, you want Rachel? Here's what you have to do. He says, fulfill Leah's week. Genesis 29. Fulfill Leah's week. You fulfill Leah's week, I'll give you Rachel. Okay. Jacob says, I'll fulfill Leah's week. The same way Paul says in Romans 11.25, as he's quoting Genesis 48.19, there is a blindness that has befallen the Jews partially until the fullness of the Gentiles comes in. Malo ha-goyim. From Genesis 48.19 and Romans 11.25, it's the same word in Hebrew. Malo ha-goyim. To fulfill the Gentiles, or the fullness of the Gentiles. Malo, to fulfill, or fullness, is the same word used in Genesis 29. Fulfill her week. Male, or malo, is the same word. So just as Leah's week has to be fulfilled before you can get Rachel, so too the fullness of the Gentiles has to come in before you can get Judaism. So it's actually a prophecy of how we bring the Messiah to where he can have the two brides, Rachel and Leah, coming under one flock. Just as he says in John 10, 16, I have sheep, not of this fold, but the two shall become one with one shepherd, so that he can have both brides, the Jew and the Gentile, as one in him. But he's not going to get Judaism until there's a fullness of the Gentiles. What does that look like? I talk about this in depth in, in, in my book, Joseph's Identity Crisis, where I, and I've done many teachings on this. The fullness of the Gentiles has nothing to do with number. It has to do with a fullness of discipleship. There is a prophecy in Zechariah 8.23 that says, In the end of days, ten Gentiles will take hold of the corner of the tzitzit, which is the fringe or the garment of a, of a Jewish man, and those ten Gentiles will look and say to the Jewish people, we know that God is with you. Meaning, Gentiles have to come to a fullness of revelation of the Jewish Messiah to where they're going to take a hold of him and then they're going to look at the Jewish people and say, we know that God is with you. There is a turning back of the Gentiles to face the Jew as the two cherubim over the ark were facing each other, which I talk about on a Passover video I did a couple months ago, who those two are. They're actually two brothers. Jacob and Esau facing each other. Just they're, they're, they're sons with the same father, just as Judaism and Christianity are sons with the same father. There has to be a fullness of discipleship, a fullness of identity, a fullness of walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. There has to be a baptism of the Holy Spirit upon the Gentiles, a revelation upon the Gentiles, because it says in Deuteronomy 32 as well as in Romans 11, that the Gentiles are going to bring about a jealousy in the Jew. You don't make a Jew or somebody jealous by taking something that is not theirs. You make somebody jealous by taking something that is theirs. The Jewish Messiah in his Jewish context, according to the Torah, the feasts, the Sabbath, all these different things, by taking what is theirs and loving it really well, you cause them to become jealous. And then when there is a fullness of Leah's week, when there is a fullness of the Gentiles, Jacob, the Messiah, can have Rachel. He can have Judaism. It says in Romans 11.25, a partial blindness has befallen Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles have come in until Leah's week is fulfilled. Meaning right now is the time of the Gentiles. It is time for us to step into our place as the proper bride without blemish, devoted and baptized in the Holy Spirit and fire, walking in power, walking in anointing, walking in revelation, walking obsessed with the scriptures and walking in the Torah of the Messiah as Paul talks about in Galatians 6.2, studying the Torah, studying the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, being filled with the Word of God, 
being filled with the love of God, and coming to a fullness of identity to where the Messiah is seen within us, and within that, it says the Jewish people will see that there is a Messiah amongst us. And when they see that that Messiah is within us, it says that they become jealous. And that they want not what we have, but who we have. Just as Rachel became jealous of Leah, because Leah is bearing all these children, meanwhile Rachel is fruitless, her womb is barren. We have to become fruitful like Leah. We have to bear the fruits of the Messiah. As it says in John 15, a good tree or a branch that is not attached to the vine can bear no fruit. Apart from Jesus, we can do nothing. But Jesus says, a branch that does not bear fruit will be cut off and thrown into the fire. But a branch that bears fruit in me, in him, in Messiah, will be pruned to bear more fruit. Leah made Rachel jealous because of all the fruitfulness of her womb. Genesis 29 and 30, go read it. Through our fruitfulness in the Messiah, we can cause this jealousy to where the Messiah himself can have the two women, the two brides, the two wives. And there will be a unification under one groom, under one shepherd, as it says in John 10. 16. In fact, I want to finish this reading the words of the precious Messiah. It says in John 10, But son acherot yesh li, asher enan min hamichla hazot, ba'alai lenahem gamotam. There are sheep for me, which are not of this fold. And it is upon me to also lead them. And they will hear my voice. And they will become one flock. And there will be one shepherd. Just as Jacob has two brides. He came for one, didn't get it. He got the other. Jesus came for one people. He didn't get it. Got the other. But through the fullness of fulfilling Leah's week. Through the fullness of the Gentiles. Jacob can have Rachel, Messiah can have the Jewish people, and we can all become one and bring him here. It is our job to hasten the Messiah's coming. It is our job to team up with him. It is our job to walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. It is our job to walk in sanctification and righteousness and in purity and in devotion to him. Relentless pursuit, obsession with him, obsession with the word of God. Baptized and consumed in the Holy Spirit and fire to where it's no longer you who live but Messiah within us. To where you have the Word of God flowing through you like a river. You know, one of the things I talk about in my new book, Trees of Fire, I talked about how the Father gave me a dream last year, uh, a little bit before Pentecost, and He showed me that I was preaching before 3,000 people. And in the dream, my notes that I had a sermon in were washed out. They were written in Sharpie and then water like splatter, splattered it out so I couldn't read it. And I was very worried. I was about to step before 3,000 people with no notes or prepared sermon. And in the dream, the 3,000 people were already prepared by the Holy Spirit to receive whatever I was coming to say. And the Holy Spirit in the dream burned a message inside of me. I didn't even need my notes. I just walked up and I knew what I was about to preach. When I woke up, the Lord gave me the dream interpretation from Acts 2.41. He says, Nick, the 3,000 that you preached to that were ready were the same 3,000 that Peter preached to when he stood up on Pentecost and they were all saved. And he told me, if you will never use a note ever again, I will give you the words to speak in its proper time. And ever since then, since I came back into ministry from my four-month sabbatical in 2022, I've never used a single note. In fact, most of the time, I don't even open up my Bible. Because the Lord, I say this in my book, in Trees of Fire, how the Lord has actually not only given me the words to speak, but I consume myself in the Word and in prayer that the Holy Spirit has brought me to memorize the Scriptures. I talk about how... The scripture says Jesus is the word of God. He's the walking word of God made flesh. He is the Bible turned into a person with flesh and blood and bones 
walking on the earth to where Jesus doesn't need to hold a Bible. Everything he speaks is Bible. He is the Word of God. It's not something that he tries to memorize. He is the Word of God. Well, the Scripture says, 1 John 2, 6, If I say I abide in him, I also ought to walk as he walked. And Jesus says, As the Father, in John 20, 21, As the Father sent me, so I send you. Meaning, as the Father sent me as the Word of God, I'm sending you as the Word of God. In Galatians 2.20 says, It's no longer I who live, but the Messiah within me. In Leviticus 26, verses 11 and 12, it says, If we walk in His ways, it says, I, I, which is on my last uh, video from uh, Torah of Messiah from, from, from this, uh, just, just recently, where I talk about how it says, I will walk continually inside of you. What is it saying? If Jesus is the Word of God, I can be the Word of God in Him. To where, like I said, we just begin to overflow. Everything we say is scripture. Everything we do, we just begin to flow with revelation because we can be so consumed by him. And I talk about it in my book how I have the ability now to be the walking word of God as Jesus is the walking word of God because it's no longer I who live but Messiah in me. I can memorize, speak, and live out scripture just as he did by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 8, 1 through 5 says, because of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, we can now fulfill the righteousness of the Torah because it permeates me from the inside out. I'm a new creation in Him that walks in the restored image of the Garden of Eden intimacy in the Messiah because of He who died for me and sent the Holy Spirit to consume me in holy fire. By us doing this, Leah's week will be fulfilled. There will be a fullness of the Gentiles. And everybody around us, Jew and Gentile, will see who is within us. And Jacob will get Rachel. Jesus will get the Jewish people. And the two will have one groom with one shepherd. So friends, let's walk in power. Let's walk in righteousness. Let's walk in repentance. And let's hasten the coming of Messiah and be the bride that he is looking for. He wants a bride that longs and burns for him, not something casual for him. No groom wants a casual bride. Every groom wants a bride that burns for the bridegroom. Every husband wants a bride that burns for him, that longs for him, that teams up with him. So it's your job and my job through the Torah of the Messiah to be revealed the prophecies of the scriptures as it says in Proverbs 25.2, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but it's the glory of kings to reveal a matter. Well, we are called in Revelation chapter 1 verse 6 and Revelation 20 verse 6, we're called kings and priests to our God. So it's our glory as a king to reveal the scriptures by the Holy Spirit. Just as I've revealed the scriptures and the secrets of the two brides straight out of the Torah as it's presented in the Gospels and what is still needing to be fulfilled today. So friends, let's join together, and let's help Messiah fulfill this prophecy.